And connect the CNC. There we go. We'll launch the GUI. And error. Hmm. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't allow you to do that. Huh. So about a year ago, I shot my first video on Linux CNC. And in fact, I'm still working on that plasma table build I began way back then. <laughs> you know, I swear, when you do things for YouTube and you take the time to like plan out videos and shoot them and edit them and upload and all that stuff, it really does make everything take 10 times longer. But at least by now, the machine is up and running and it works surprisingly well. You know, it's not the most accurate thing, but it is good enough for my home shop needs. Uh, and it does have a couple cool features I was able to add to it because of it running on Linux CNC. Really, the biggest thing left me to do with this project is to document how exactly it works. Because back when I began filming, you know, a whole year ago, I shot one video that explained how to do a very basic setup with the StepConf wizard right here. Now this tool is great for doing, again, very basic machines. Things like a mill, where you're using a parallel port, breakout board, and stepper motors, and really have no extra hardware add-ons to speak of. And this is great. But once you get beyond those basics, uh, this tool quickly becomes woefully inadequate, and you really need to go beyond that and edit the configuration files manually to get anything extra added onto your machine. So what I want to do now is a series explaining how to do those do those advanced configurations. The focus will be on how, uh, the hardware abstraction layer in Linux CNC. And that's uh, basically a feature of it that lets you tie in different components in hardware and software all to one thing in a way you really couldn't do if it were all just wiring in a wiring cabinet. Now, how does get a bad rap because it can very quickly get very complex. And if you don't take the time to you know, buckle down and learn how it works, it's just all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. But <laughs> that is why I'm here, okay? To help you learn this and to learn it for real, okay? How it gets crazy, but it lets you do crazy cool shit. So it is worth learning for real and not simply copy and pasting somebody else's configurations that you found online, mine included, okay? <laughs> this is like the third time I've begun shooting the series, but I'm pretty sure I have a good breakdown for it now. In this video, we're gonna cover the files you get directly after running the StepConf wizard. Then in the next eight videos, give or take, we're gonna cover other handy parts of the INI file, how to drive a relay from G-code, how to drive that same relay, now from PyVCP, uh, how to add an Xbox controller, and then subroutines and shortcuts on the buttons of the controller, how to do OMIC probing, how to do manual torch eye control, how to edit a how component to add even more features, and then lastly, how to do automatic torch eye control with the Arduino-based THC I'd shown in other recent videos of mine. And even after all that, we might do a bonus round, just a general Linux tips and tricks, because I figure a lot of you looking to use Linux CNC might not have other experience, which is general Linux systems. Whereas for me, that's basically my day job. And I think there's a few things I can share with you to help me be productive when working on Linux. But we'll see if that video comes next or at the end or not at all, you know, we'll see. But Anyway, we do still have a lot to cover here, slowly building up the configurations I currently use on my plasma table. And while this is all written for my plasma table, the same concept should apply no matter what sort of CNC machine you're building. Whether it's a plasma or a router or a mill with a tool changer or a really huge 3D printer, it's all the same concepts once you learn how to use how. Now, even with everything we are covering, there's a few things we're not gonna touch on. Okay, all the work we're doing will be with Linux version 2.7.14. That's the latest stable release of Linux CNC. We're not gonna be using the main line for anything extra. We're only gonna use the last stable release at the time of this video. Uh, we also won't touch on any of the alternate GUIs. Everything we're gonna use being done in Axis, the uh, GUI you've probably seen before. Um, we won't be using any servos or Meza hardware, simply because I personally have not missed with them and don't have the hardware to even test them out. Um, and that's basically it, okay? But, but even with those few things we're skipping, by the time we finish the series, you should be able to consider yourself an expert novice with Linux CNC. Before we begin, I wanna point you to a few of the resources that might be helpful. 
For one, the documentation on Linux CNC is very good, and a lot of it comes pre-installed with the system. So here we have the manual in PDF form, and it's some 700 and something pages. Okay? <laughs> very long, but very thorough. You know, those two things, they go hand in hand. So if I touch on anything briefly in one of my videos, and you want to read more about it, I'd say the PDF docs are probably the first place you want to look. All right. Uh, for a quicker reference, when you're working on the command line, there's also the man pages that are a typical thing on Linux systems. So for example, uh, mankins gives you a list of kinematic engines included in Linux CNC and a brief description of what each one is for. And again, this comes pre-installed on any Linux system. Uh, the forums are also very good over on linuxcnc.org. Uh, the people there are very helpful, knowledgeable, friendly, all that. Um, maybe a little bit weird, you know, but this is Linux. That's kind of what you get. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to uh, ask any in-depth questions or brainstorm or spitball with a group of people who work with Linux CNC, the forums are probably the best place to ask. Uh, over here on YouTube, I can think of a few other channels that have some pretty good C uh, Linux CNC content. There's uh, Rust Stuff, Ask Jerry, and Samco Inc. I'll put links to those channels down below. Uh, and if I come across any others in the future, I'll try and remember to come back here and add them to the list as well. And of course, you are also welcome to ask questions on the comments of any of my videos. Just please be sure you ask good questions. All right? If you ask bad questions, I'm probably going to ignore you because i got better stuff to do. <laughs> if you take the time to write a good question, I will try to find the time to give you a good answer and to help you out. All right? Now, if you find these videos helpful, uh, you're also welcome to go ahead and subscribe. Uh, that is, of course, free. And if I ever do have ways for you to, uh, you know, give me money, whether it's selling CNC kits or t-shirts or whatever, uh, there'll be links for those down below. At this time, I don't have any of that, but uh, I figure I'd just mention it for future proofing because once you upload a video to YouTube, it's, you know, there forever. Anyway, uh, let's get to it. So we installed Linux, set up the machine, uh, ran the StepCon Blizzard, and now we have a thing that works. If we hit the shortcut here in the desktop, it loads the Nexus GUI, we can turn the machine on, uh, drag it around, home it out, um, run the default G code, you know, nothing crashes, it all works, great, okay? So from here, where do we go to keep making improvements? Well, those files are saved in your scene, Linux CNC directory in your home, right here. Now, personally, I work better from the command line, so I'm gonna pop a terminal open, and we're gonna spend most of our time in here. Don't be scared, you know, it's a terminal, but it's not that bad, I promise. And once you get the hang of it, it's actually really efficient. So we're in my home, home slash Strollbo, go to Linux CNC directory, and take a look at what's in here. Now the readme is a file I wrote, you can uh, just look past that, because who reads the readme, right? Who? <laughs> and then uh, inside the configs directory, we've got uh, one subdirectory for every configuration for this CNC machine. So if you've seen my older videos, you might remember seeing like a, a CNC-coffee and CNC-plasma over here, back when I was working on building this thing out and testing out different configurations. Now I would say, generally speaking, per CNC machine in your shop, you're gonna have one desktop running Linux CNC, and it's gonna have just one configuration in it for running the GUI. Um, in theory, if you wanted to, you could have one computer running multiple machines if you like unplug the uh, the parallel port breakout board and plug in the parallel port breakout board for a different machine, right? Like say you have a mill and a lathe in your shop, they're both CNC, but you only have one desktop, you could plug it into the mill, when you want to use a lathe, unplug it, haul it over the across the shop, plug it in the lathe. Ugh, it just sounds like a pain in the ass though, right? Especially when a computer that runs Linux CNC costs like 50 bucks. Uh, you know, I'd say for that price, it's worth having one computer that runs Linux CNC with one configuration for one machine for every CNC machine you want to have in your shop. Okay, now this uh, directory has all the files that Linux CNC cares about. And the StepConf file here is just for working with the StepConf wizard. Let's take a quick peek at what's in that. So this one gets populated with basically every value you enter when going through the StepConf wizard. So a lot of this should look pretty familiar. Like pin one, I made my spin the lawn. Pin 10, I made all my homes. Further down, you have like your X limits and things. It's like my X max limit, 48.25. That's just over four feet of travel on my plasma table. 
and that's where all of this gets saved. But this file is not used when you actually launch the, uh, the GUI for Linux CNC. Okay? This is only used as a reference for the wizard. So when you rerun the uh, step conf wizard, it can pre-populate everything again, and you don't need to put it all in from scratch. Now, really, once you've uh, set things up with the wizard in the basic way, this file and the wizard aren't that useful anymore because every time you run it, it does overwrite some of the files in your configuration directory, okay? It's like these three up top for uh, custom how, custom XML, and custom uh, post GUI. Those get saved for you and your custom edits, but the main how file and the uh, INI file get overwritten every time. And we are gonna have some tweaks to the INI file in particular. So if every time you run the wizard again, this file gets overwritten, eh, really, once you've run it the once um, and got your machine up and running the basic way, uh, from then on out, any other tweaks you wanna do, you should probably do by hand in these files. And once you look at them, you can kind of see how the translation from this step comp file to all these guys happens. And it's not, not that complex. So moving forward in the how tutorial directory. Now we've got, let's see, uh, these var files here are saved, uh, save parameters between runs and XCNC. And the tool.table one saves a couple different tools and their offsets if you have a, like a mill with a tool changer. Things we really don't need to worry about and things that actually change from run to run in these, uh, these var files here. So if you actually look at the, uh, the git ignore for this project, you'll see I called these files out specifically as ones we don't need to care about. So all the uh, configuration files we're looking at right now and every incremental change that we're gonna use in the series is already up on GitHub with uh, links down in the description of this video below. <clears throat> but with that uh, GitHub project, a few of these files, like these var files, we don't need to care about, they're not included because they just change all the time and they're, they're just extra noise we can ignore. The ones we are gonna care about are uh, mostly these HAL, uh, XML, and INI files. So the custom uh, ones are all left for your edits and right now, since we've just started, there's uh, you know, nothing of note in there. You know, this is a comment. Uh, same thing with the post GUI. Again, it's just a comment. Um, and the ones we're gonna look at right now are that default INI file and the default how file. So for the INI file, um, think of it like this. If it has to do with wiring uh, and connecting things up, it's in the how. If it has to do with, uh, you know, default files and settings, and stuff like that, it's in the INI. So the main things in here are probably down at the bottom where it defines your different axes and all of their uh, parameters. So like axis zero is your my X, uh, one is my Y, and two is my Z. So again, you'll see on the X axis, I've got uh, 48.25 uh, inches of travel. Same we saw before in the step count wizard. So if I uh, you know later upgrade my plasma machine by making a brand new table and giving it 10 feet of travel, I would come back in here and uh, crank that up from 48 to uh, you know 120, right? Let's see. Uh, and yeah, up above, there's a few other settings we're gonna look at later that have to do with like the default jog speed and the place it looks for files to load when you load up the access GUI, uh, like G code files and things like that. But uh, this is all of those kind of settings. And looking at the main how file, oh God, right? <laughs> this is where it gets messy. Nah, no, not, not really, it's not that bad. I promise, I promise. Bear with me, this will make sense once you walk through it, okay? So this file is the one that defines all the different wiring that hooks up the different, uh, I guess, black boxes that make Linux CNC work, okay? It's so like this one here is full of all the stuff for running our stepper motors. And we won't need to make any changes here, but it's still good to take a look over it as an example of the how we'll be building out later on. So this how file begins the way most of them do by loading up a few different how components. So for example, this is loading up uh, Trivkins and that is the trivial kinematics engine. Let's look at the man page for that. You see it pulls up that one we saw before listing all the different kinematic engines here in Linux CNC. And Trivkins, it says, is for 
you know, trivial machines, the one with a correspondence between joints and axes. Great. Now, what exactly does that mean? Um, I guess the best way to explain that is to provide a counterexample. If you can imagine like a, a CNC robotic arm on like a welding machine, right? Like that would not be trivial kinematics. If you tell that machine to move like one foot in the X direction, that move is in one axis, but the way the machine moves is by moving like four different motors to like make the arm actuate that one foot. So that machine is not trivial, whereas most like mills, lathes, routers, plasmas, etc., are trivial kinematics. Then uh, the next line here, what exactly is this syntax? Oh God, getting messy again. Trust me, no, not that bad. So here, this line is uh, basically referring to sections in the INI file. So if we look at that and look for the EMC mont uh, section, let's see, EMC mont, there we go. And we can see it's loading up mot mod, the motion module. And there's a few other uh, settings here like for your uh, base thread period and your servo thread period that are also being used uh, over here in the how. So that's all it's doing. It looks funny, but it's just calling out to things that are in your INI file. Next up, it's loading up the module for working with your parallel port breakout board and passing in a configuration so that it uh, knows you know, how many and where those parallel port boards are. And again, if you're wondering like, what is the CFG? Like what value do you pass to here? Well, if you look at the man page for how port, it goes into that and explains, you know, how do you, uh, how do you get that parallel port uh, address? So eventually if I want to go back and add a second parallel port breakout board to my machine, like if I got, um, well, I have one parallel port board on that machine by default. You can get uh, add-on cards for your PCIe slots that give you additional parallel port breakout boards. So I can add a second one and actually double my number of pins if I wanted to. Um, don't think I'll actually do that, but you know, the option is there by just adding a bit of hardware and changing the how. Next up, we're loading up the uh, step generator that actually runs the servos. And then there's a little logic component that uh, this how ends up using somewhere down the line. Then moving on, we are uh, attaching each of these modules we loaded to different threads in the next CNC. So to so running our CNC machine, there's basically two, uh, two threads in the process that are continually running over and over again to make things appear as if they're running in real time, right? Like a modern processor runs at like three gigahertz or something, some crazy fast speed. So every, uh, what is a giga? Nanosecond, something? A very, on a very, very short time frame, the computer has the ability to run uh, some steps in your code, right? And you can run that fast enough that it basically appears to be real time. And Linux CNC runs both a base thread for the stuff that has to be very, very, very fast, and then a servo thread for things that can afford to be a little bit slower. So again, looking over here, we can see my base thread runs at, uh, what, 100,000 nanoseconds, or one-tenth of a millisecond, and the servo thread is running at one, uh, 1 million nanoseconds, AKA one millisecond, a thousand times per second. Now the difference in those two threads is that the base period thread cannot run uh, any computations with floating point numbers, whereas the servo thread can. Uh, floating point numbers are like a slower calculation to do, so it doesn't let you run them on the base thread because um, things there need to run fast. So from what I found, basically your step pulse generator has to run on the base thread, but basically everything else can run on the servo and that's still plenty fast enough, right? Let's see, now moving down a bit further, we get on to our first net commands. Net commands are gonna be the core of your HAL. They're kind of like making digital wires, hooking up components in software. Uh, the term net comes from PCB and circuit design, so you can kind of see why they use it here because this how file is like building out a software emulated PCB. Now as for why electrical engineers called nets, that I have no idea, but that's where the term came from and that's where they use it over here in how. So the first thing a net command does 
is it, it assigns the signal a name, kind of like uh, color coding your wires. So here we have a net, the signal name is spindle on, and you can think of that like the color of this digital wire. In fact, if you wanted to, you could like put your Corolla box and rename all the signals with different colors. Uh, but since these wires only exist in software and they aren't like physical things you can see and hold and look and see the color, uh, it's probably better to give them names that are human friendly and easier to read and like follow along, right? So calling this wire spindle on, that makes sense to a human, right? <laughs> now these uh, wires need to be hooked up to uh, pins, right, to how pins, pins in software. Now some uh, how component pins eventually do bubble down to a thing in, um, you know, in reality, in meat space, right, like a, a PowerPort uh, module, it has how pins, and those eventually correspond to the physical pins on your parallel port breakout board. But for a lot of how components, they exist only in software, such as the motion component that is purely on the Linux CNC machine. There's no, um, no real thing you can wire up something to in, you know, in reality. Now in how we have three kinds of pins, uh, inputs, outputs, and input outputs. They do both. So an input pin takes an input, an output pin gives an output. And every signal can have uh, up to one output attached to it, and then as many inputs as it wants. So when you have multiple inputs uh, attached to your signal, it's kind of like you have a wire nut splitting out a physical wire. So again, let's use the uh, spindle on here as an example. So it says we got uh, this motion module and the uh, spindle on pin here. So if we look at motion and then spindle on, there we go. You can see spindle on is an output pin and it puts out a bit. So a bit is like a one or a zero, true or false, high or low, you know, depending on how you want to think about it. But uh, basically when you run either M3 or M4 in G code to turn your spindle on, that sets the spindle on pin here to be high or true. And then the uh, net command here makes that signal appear on the spindle on signal. Then running M5 turns it false and turns the signal low again. And these arrows here, they're just for humans to make it easier to read. Uh, Linux CNC ignores them, but if you give it an arrow pointing at the signal, it kind of is a, a note to you to let you know that spindle on is an output pin available in the motion module. And then a few lines later, we take the spindle on uh, signal and we wire that up to this par port pin. Now, why does this say output? Well, because on the parallel port breakout board, this is one of the outputs, right? Pin one is an output pin. So in HAL, it's an input receiving the signal and it spits it out on the physical output pin on the breakout board. Now here, the zero refers to this being the first parallel port breakout board. If you've worked with software and stuff very much, you'll know in a lot of languages, uh, zero ends up being used for the first one and then one is for the second, two is for the third, you know, like things often count from zeros in computers. So parport.0 is the first one. If I ever did go back and add a second parallel port and a second parallel port breakout board, then we'd have parport.1 and then the whole same uh, assortment of pins. Now somehow components can be loaded multiple times like the parport one and then others you can only have one instance of them like motion over here. You know, with Linux CNC, you only get one spindle at a time. Now the set p command is used for setting a constant to either an input pin or a parameter. We haven't touched on parameters yet. They're kind of like input pins, except not as useful. <laughs> you can only set them with set p. You can't net an output pin to them. But if you go back and look at the uh, par port, uh, let's see, uh, par port, and look for invert, we'll see, uh, ah, yes, there's a parameter for every pin called invert that inverts the output of the pin. Now, in my case, uh, I've mentioned before that my uh, relays trigger when the pin on the relay is pulled down to ground. So by setting the invert to, you know, true, to one is true, um, that means when the spindle on signal is true, 
then the parallel port pin gets pulled low. And when the spindle, uh, spindle on signal is high, the parallel, or no, is false there. Then the parallel port pin puts out high, turns the relay off. And then it's up to you to wire that relay to, uh, you know, the first pin on your parallel port breakout board, and then hook your tool up to the relay. And in my case, that's the plasma cutter. So if all this HAL is straightforward, plugging this to that and this to that, how exactly is this useful? Well, imagine you had a CNC mill with an enclosure, and you wanted to have an interlock for that enclosure so you can move the machine around when the door is open, but you can't run the spindle. Well, then you put a contact switch on the door and wire that to one of your parallel port input pins. Uh, and then you can do something kind of like, let's see, like this. Where you take uh, your spindle on signal and you take, let's see, a door closed uh, signal. And that door closed would be from a uh, power port zero, when I think like pin 12 is an input. So say tw pin 12 in, and we're gonna wire that to an AND two, which I haven't loaded, but you can imagine I did, and load that and take that parallel port input and send that to a HAL AND two component. Then we take the spindle on and forward that to the other AND2 input. And then where we have this spindle on, let's see, we would change this to be uh, spindle AND door and make it be AND2 out feeding to here now, okay? So that's like a few lines change. Let me explain like kind of what we're doing. So if we had this uh, contact switch on our uh, parallel port pin 12, then we check that to see uh, when it's opened or closed. We put this as a component that basically takes uh, two values and then only returns true if they both are true. So if the spindle's on and the door's closed, then the output of AND2 is true, and then it goes to the um, power port that runs the relay. Now, if either one of these things is false, either the door is open or the spindle is intentionally turned off because you ran AM5, uh, then the uh, signal to your power port is false and the relay does not run. So now if you ran M3 and the door is open, the spindle wouldn't turn on until you shut the door. At that point, the uh, spindle would actually turn on immediately and maybe that's not so great either, but <laughs> it gives you the idea of how this is supposed to work and how powerful it is and the ability to build things out. Because like wiring up those two in sequence, uh, you know, that would be a messy solder job and like wires would come loose and it'd just be no fun. But doing it in software is like two lines of code, not that bad. Now the Howlinglist file is probably some more complicated stuff you're gonna run into just because there's a lot of it here all at once and it's just dumped here by the Cepconf wizard. The stuff we're gonna write for our own additions is gonna be a lot more straightforward, a lot more concise, and really a lot more clear. Luckily, because this is for the separate motors, which are already up and running, we really don't need to mess around with anything else in this file. It's all just controlling those motors, and since it already works, we're gonna like kinda of just gloss over the rest of it. Uh, you're welcome to come back here and poke around and look at it more and kinda of like reference the uh, documentation and kind of get a better grasp of how things in here work. But I'm gonna say this video is going on long enough and for a basic intro to how, we're gonna call it good and I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.